okey ah uh, okay. uh, tu dah boleh dah tu ah uh, akhir ni so kita admit semua ke admit semua oh saya tak uh, boleh dan admit all admit all but share the QR code okey <coughs> Hilang pula. Kok saya dah hilang je hari ni ni? Prof. Suzana pun uh, dah bising ni weh. Um, Prof. Suzana, please admit everyone. Uh, okay, scan tak? Dah masuk kan semua? Dan dan semua saya dah, uh, saya dah masuk kan? Dan tak ada waiting room dah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ramai dah tu. The participants are coming. So welcome to all participants. Please scan using your um, UKM Smart Attendance for this QR code. We will register it for each spell. Faiza, boleh take note for this uh, manual manual kehadiran kan? Boleh boleh. Oh, Puan Rahida. So um, you have another two or three minutes to scan your uh, QR code or else we can actually share the QR code again at the end of the session. Okay. All right, so our secretary will take note on the attendance in the chat box. Um, it's only for staff, uh, unfortunately. Uh, for students, you need to uh, use my UKM apps. I think you can do that as well. So I think we're going to start soon. Okay. All right. So, uh, 
I think we can start lah, Fai. Uh, we can share the QR code again at the end of the session. So let's uh, give Michael to share his screen. So Assalamualaikum, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, special lecture from our international distinguished um, professor um, from quite far from Australia, but um, in Adelaide in South Australia. So Prof. Dr. Michael Fennec was my um, supervisor during my PhD. So I look up to him sincerely since like when I was doing my PhD until now actually. So um, it's my pleasure to actually introduce to you um, Prof. Dr. Michael Fennec. By the way, I'm Dr. Razina, so I'll be your uh, moderator for today. So um, Prof. Dr. Michael Fennec now is uh, retired from CSIRO. He used to work uh, in CSIRO, but he is now leading um, Genome Health Foundation based in South Australia. And also he is now affiliated with University of South Australia. And also um, now he is the international professor, um, distinguished professor for our faculty, Faculty of Health Sciences, University Kebangsaan Malaysia for one year starting in October. So we are very privileged to have him here today to share um, his lecture and his research passion on personalized nutrition. So um, just leave brief background on um, Professor Michael. So his H index is actually 70 in um, Web of Science and also um, in Google Scholar, his H index is 90. So you can imagine how many publications that he has. He has actually more than 300 papers, um, mainly on radiation biology, uh, nutritional genomics, genetic toxicology, and also um, more to degenerative disease of aging. So um, I think personalized nutrition is a topic that anyone could relate because it's very individual. Everybody loves eating. Everybody actually eat every day. So it something that um, very close to you. So I think um, this topic would uh, spark so many interests in um, a lot of researchers or students hearing this topic today. So I think without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Michael to share his talk uh, and lecture. Please, Michael. Thank you, Rosina. And hello to everyone and good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here and to join you uh, in, uh, in this role uh, with the Center of Health, Healthy Aging and Wellness at the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to this year that I will be spending uh, with the UKM and this faculty. And I hope you'll find this uh, uh, presentation interesting to you personally or scientifically. The title of my presentation is Personalized Nutrition and Future Ahead. And in this presentation, I'll explore the interaction between the, the nutrients in our diet and the genome, uh, as well as uh, um, other aspects uh, of uh, metabolism, and uh, how we can use this knowledge to provide better advice, nutritional advice for better health outcomes. So the field of nutrigenomics is where um, this aspect of personalized nutrition emerged. So the first 33% of my presentation will focus on this aspect of nutrigenomics, what it means exactly. And as you can see from the slide, there are four key aspects, the genetics, the epigenetics, and then the other aspects of metabolism, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and genomics. So the reason why the field of nutrigenomics came to be is to understand the impact of diet on the genome and metabolism. The genetics is the blueprint. The epigenetics informs us what has been programmed. The transcriptomic and proteomics gives information on what appears to happen in the body and in the cells. And metabolomics and genomics allows one to know actually what has happened and what has happened. Now, in this slide, in the second slide, uh, it, it comes from a particular uh, 
article in the journal Time about what families around the world eat in a week. And you can see obviously from the snapshot that the amount and the, and the types of foods obviously are very different from one country to another, right? And I'm sure in Malaysia, you have uh, more than one kinds of diet and uh, it will vary also from one family to another as well. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have a photo uh, of, of what a typical family in Malaysia were, uh, eats uh, when this article happened. Um, so personalized nutrition also uh, relates very much to what people in a particular country eat and what foods are available to them. So that's going to be limited and restricted by that. Now, to get a broader picture um, of how much, why food is important is because it's so much. So this is, this is just a slide about what a typical American, average American consumes, right? That's 2000 pounds of food per year, um, about five and a half pounds per day. Uh, if we look at all the chemicals in food, Apart from the macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, there's also the micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, and so on. And of course, there's also with the food come other things that we don't necessarily want. And these are toxins like pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, and so on, as well as viruses, right? So some viruses can be transmitted through the food. And we know what a problem uh, viruses can be. Uh, in a way, they are contaminants of new DNA within the cells. And that, effect, of course, affects the genome and, and what is expressed. Now, when, if one considers that aging and accelerated aging are a form of disease, then one can, should also consider what are the hallmarks uh, of aging. And at least six out of the nine uh, known hallmarks of aging relate to um, genome integrity, integrity or DNA integrity, um, such as genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, mitochondrial dysfunction, which also occurs because of damage to the DNA of the mitochondria. Damage to DNA triggers senescence. This is um, cells that are triggered to die because they're too damaged. And if that is not fixed and not dealt with, then that creates inflammation, which also drives aging. And when the cell's DNA is damaged and not functioning well, then they cannot replicate. They cannot make good copies of themselves and that leads to stem cell exhaustion. So the regenerative capacity of the body diminishes, and that's exactly what happens with aging. You basically lose your regenerative capacity, the ability to repair damaged tissue, and so on. Now, to study DNA integrity, we have a number of very good techniques, and I only show the ones that are most commonly used here on this slide. So the classical way of studying DNA damage was by looking at chromosomes. This is the classical method of metaphase analysis. One can look for breaks in the chromosomes or rearrangements and so on. Uh, defects and breaks in the chromosomes lead to malsegregation of chromosomes during mitosis and can lead to the generation of micronuclei. So these are small nuclei that contain either fragments or whole chromosomes, as seen on the left-hand side, and a lymphocyte a binucleated cell, cell with a micronucleus, or in a red blood cell. You can see these uh, blue uh, circles within the red blood cell. That's a fragment of chromosome. One can study the telomeres, which are re uh, repeat sequences at the end of chromosomes. And these are there to stop the ends of chromosomes sticking with each other. If they, are beca if they become too short or are broken off, then that creates a lot of chromosome rearrangements. Uh, one can look at breaks uh, here in this comet assay. These can be seen when the cell is in a gel and it's electrophorized. The broken DNA comes out of the nucleus. Uh, in a mitochondrion, you can see the damage 
of the circular DNA because it should, if it's intact, there should be only one band. If it's broken, there'll be multiple bands. And of course, one can also look at the basis at the very molecular level, if there are any adducts like oxidation of guanine and or methylation of DNA. Now, the first report of an association between malnutrition and DNA damage was published in 1971 in Nature, as shown in this slide. It was a study on protein calorie malnutrition, which is quite, used to be quite common. It's not so common now, thankfully. Um, and what they did in the study, they looked at uh, children with this condition called quashio core or marasmus, which is due to protein calorie malnutrition. In other words, a very low protein diet. Um, and when you look at the rate of chromosome aberrations for the normal healthy children, which is, which is shown in the black bars, sorry, I'll go back, in the black bars here, relative to the matched uh, patient, child with protein calorie malnutrition, on average, the chromosome aberration or damage rate was 5.5 fold higher than normal. And that's a big increase. That's an increase you would see with a really significant dose of ionizing radiation, which we are all worried about. So malnutrition or poor nutrition can increase the DNA damage rate to levels produced by uh, radiation and genotoxic chemicals, which is a very important point to note. Now, I'll say a bit more about the micronucleus assay because this is one we've done a lot of work on and it's one that is used worldwide now. It's one of the most widely used methods to measure DNA damage in people. So this assay is done in human, with human lymphocytes. Um, the, if the lymphocytes are damaged, they will have, uh, if they're exposed to genotoxins or there's malnutrition, poor nutrition, uh, this may lead to rearranged or broken chromosomes. The dysfunctional chromosomes, when the, when the cell divides and the chromosomes are pulled apart at anaphase, these damaged chromosomes will lag behind. They are not included in the main nuclei. And sometimes you'll have bridges occurring because the chromosomes have got two centromeres and they're pulled to opposite poles and they can't go one way or the other, so therefore they're stuck. And they form a bridge when the membrane is formed. Okay, so and you can see here a nucleoplasmic bridge between, so to, to see this, we have to block the cells at the binucleated stage. We can do that easily with cytochalasin. And we can measure the micronuclei, which you can see here, the little tiny nuclei next to the two large daughter nuclei, or you can see a bridge, and that's how the damage is measured. If there is no damage, you will just see a cell with two uniform nuclei. And with this assay, it's quite easy to measure DNA damage. Now, for example, in this study by Scarpato in Italy, they looked, instead of looking at children who are uh, who are undernourished, who have very little food or not much protein. They looked at children who are obese. Okay, so this is a big problem around the world, everywhere, in every country. And what they showed using the micronucleus assay, there was about 2.7 fold increase in micronuclei in those who were obese, but also in those who were overweight. There was no difference between overweight and obese, they, and they both had high damage. And if they looked at a marker of DNA breaks using gamma H2AX, which is another biomarker of DNA damage, the increase was eightfold. Huge, huge increase, right? So it's clear that both undernourishment or excess of calories, as occurs in obese, obesity, uh, obese children can also be deficient because they're usually, usually eating foods which are rich in calories but poor in nutrients. Um, for whatever reason, it is clear that DNA damage is elevated also in obese and overweight children. Now, why is this important? It's important because when micronuclei increase, the rate of aging increases, 
and also the risk of developmental and degenerative diseases, as well as, for example, pregnancy complications. So if we look at the right uh, top left panel here, this is a study we did in women who were at 18 weeks of pregnancy. We measured their micronucleus index. And from these results, we could see that those women who had greater than 36 micronuclei per thousand cells had a much higher risk of having preeclampsia and intrauterine growth restriction. Okay, so that means a high blood pressure during pregnancy and restricted growth of the, of the fetus. Okay, so that's not a good outcome um, at all. Uh, micronuclei are also associated with infertility and so on. So there's a whole, you could give a whole lecture about that and also um, developmental defects. In, uh, in, through the human project, the HUMN project, which is a collaboration of about 30 laboratories, we put together a cohort of about 7,000 subjects who were followed for about 12 years. And we showed in the prospective study that those with a medium or high level of micronuclei had about a 70% increased risk for cancer. In other studies, um, the uh, in other studies, that we also there were also they also looked at cardiovascular disease mortality, um, and there was an increased uh, the lymphocyte micronucleus frequency was associated prospectively with in, with cardiovascular disease mortality both in the general population and those with coronary artery disease. This index is also elevated in um, in neurodegenerative disease like. Uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Um, now, furthermore, we and the others did studies in normal, what appear to be normal healthy people with aging. And when we are born, if you're born healthy, most, the great majority of babies are born healthy, the micronucleus frequency index is very low. It's about zero to two in a thousand. But you can see here in the South Australian population, the micronuclei increase with age. So in the teenagers and young adults, it's already on average increased about two and a half to threefold and keeps on increasing with age and the spread increases. So some are accumulating more damage than others. Uh, and the rate, the rate of micronuclei reflects the rate of aging. Those who live longer appear to have slightly less than what you would predict from the data from younger people. So DNA damage increases with age, but of course it could be, and most likely is, because of poor choices of nutrition, lifestyle, physical, and socio-psychological environments. And we know that that is the case from a number of other studies. So we are born with a low level of DNA damage rate. Right? That's why we are here, because if we, there was damage in the fetus, that fetus most likely dies. Right? So those of us who are here are lucky because we were, uh, when we were in our mother's womb, we were being maintained at a low rate of damage. And that's why you see a low rate of damage now in live and healthy babies. But, so that's the possible and normal rate of damage. But what is the threshold of damage we should allow? Can we design environments that enable us to stay below this threshold? That is the fundamental question. And that is the reason, that's where nutrition can play a very important part. And while that is important, not only at the population level, but also at the individual level, right? You can imagine if one is planning a, fam a family, planning to have children and so on, it's very important for the father and the mother to have as low DNA damage rate as possible, because we know that those couples that have higher DNA damage rates will have pregnancy complications. The risk increases, and, and that has been shown in a number of studies. So how does nutrition play a role in maintenance of DNA integrity? So there are, um, we know quite a lot these days. We don't know everything for sure, but we know that, for example, folate, B12, the methyl donors, choline and methionine, Right? These are important nutrients that can donate a carbon atom. 
They're needed, needed for maintaining the methylation status of cytosine, which is important to maintain the epigenome and centromere function, to convert uracil into thymidine, okay, which is very important for chromosome stability. The antioxidant vitamins and cofactors are needed to prevent oxidation of bases and to prevent breaks in the DNA. And then there's a, a number of cofactors such as zinc, magnesium, and so on, which are critical for DNA polymerase and DNA repair enzyme function. If you are deficient, if you are deficient in any of these, this can cause breakage in the chromosomes, mass segregation of the chromosomes, anaphase bridge formation, and chromosomal instability. Now, I'll, I'll just give one example here, which I'm sure Rosina is familiar with. Because this is, uh, this is some of the nice work that Rosina did when she was in my lab as a PhD student, showing the impact of zinc on DNA damage and cell death. Okay, so in Rosina's experiment, she measured um, the micronuclei, the nucleoplasmic bridges, and the nuclear buds in this micronuclear cytome assay. She also did the comet assay. And you can see here with all of these tests, it's clear that the DNA damage level is minimized when zinc concentration is in the range of four to 16 micromolar. Okay, now you can see that's a very tight concentration and it doesn't take much to be either deficient or to be in excess because both deficiency and excess with nutrients tends to cause some problem. And certainly in this case with zinc, there's an increase in DNA damage in excess as well as in deficiency. Razina also measured the protein levels of gamma H2AX, uh, which also uh, was increased. And uh, OGG1, which is a, uh, an enzyme needed for, um, to repair damage from oxidative stress, which was increased in response to the damage as well as other proteins such as procaspase, which is activated during apoptosis, which is increased in deficiency, and metallothionin, which is increased when zinc concentration increases. So apart from the DNA damage, there's also cell death as apoptosis, as well as necrosis increasing in the cells. In this way, one gets a full picture of what's happening. Now, these levels of damage that are produced are actually significant, as I already tried to mention before, um, at the beginning of the talk in the, in the protein calorie malnourished and obese kids. Now to put that in the context in a more direct manner, I show you here the dose response curve for ionizing radiation for x-rays, right? Everybody uh, is rightly concerned about being exposed to radiation because we know it increases cancer. And here's the dose response with x-rays in the, in the low dose range, but it's still on safe range from zero to 20 rad, okay? This same technique, the micronucleus assay, um, the cytokinesis block micronucleus assay, that's where it's called micronuclei and the binucleated cells, um, was validated a long time ago during my PhD uh, for ionizing radiation biodosimetry. In fact, it is a standard test for measuring um, radiation exposure, and, and it's endorsed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. You can see here from the blue line that going from zero to 20 rad increases the micronuclei almost twofold, a bit more than twofold. But if I overlay on that, the dose response curve for folate deficiency in the, fo in the physiological range, going from a high dose of 120 to a low concentration of 12, which is quite common in populations that don't have fortification of folate, the level of damage is the same as that of 20 rad of x-rays, which is about 20 times your annual allowed exposure limit of radiation. So again, this emphasizes the important point that poor nutrition causes damage and it causes as much damage as toxic radiation and toxic genotoxic chemicals. Now, what about other nutrients and how can we look at the whole of diet? 
One way is, for example, in this study. This was a study done we're using dietary questionnaires to find out what people are eating. And then from dietary questionnaire to measure the amount of intake of vitamins and minerals um, in the South Australian population. And what this slide shows you is the change in the micronucleus frequency index and the DNA damage index in relation to increasing intake of these nutrients. These are the nutrients that had significant effects. So what the study showed was vitamin E, calcium folate, retinol, and nicotinic acid all reduced the micronutrient frequency index substantially up to um, 45% in a dose-related manner. Whilst the dietary pattern that was rich in riboflavin, pantothenate, and biotin tended to increase the DNA damage level. And beta-carotene was a U-shaped curve in the mid-tertile of intake relative to the lowest tertile. So these are the results for the mid and highest tertile relative to the lowest tertile. Well, with beta-carotene, it's a U-shaped curve. And this has been observed in other studies as well. So excessive intake of beta-carotene uh, may not be a good thing, as is the dietary pattern that is, has, got, has got excessive intakes of riboflavin, pantothenate, and biotin. Although we don't know the mechanisms just yet, we just have some idea with riboflavin what's happening and come back to that later. Now, with this, you can also look at nutrient nutrient interactions. So, from that same study, we could see that if you look at the interaction of calcium with folate, that you get the strongest effect in those people with the highest third, the strongest reduction in DNA damage, and those with a dietary pattern in the high, that has the highest tertile of calcium intake and highest tertile of folate intake. Uh, whilst with riboflavin, um, DNA damage increased the most in those people with the lowest tertile of folate intake and the highest tertile of riboflavin intake. So there is also nutrient-nutrient interaction. And we would expect that certainly with riboflavin and folate because they are in the same metabolic pathway. Now, we know if we, for example, look at these nutrients, calcium, folate, niacin, vitamin E, beta, carotene, and retinol, and look at the foods which have uh, enough of these, uh, um, the amounts uh, enough amount in 100 grams, in this case expressed as a percentage of the minimum requirement for optimum genome health, in other words, to maximize the reduction in DNA damage. You can see that almonds and wheat bran and cheddar cheese and broccoli are rich in these nutrients, but other foods like beef and banana are not, they don't provide these nutrients. So careful choice, these are just examples, okay? And you could take any food and look at it in the same way. Um, so the careful choice of foods is really critical and important uh, to, to know how to put together a diet that can deliver the nutrients needed for maintenance of genome integrity, okay? Now, to go a bit deeper, I'll just give you the example of folate. Right now, we know that we get folate from plant food. Now, if you look at plant foods and look at the pulses, leafy or cruciferous vegetables, roots or tubers, and fruit vegetables, they are really different when it comes to folate. The roots or tubers and the fruit vegetables are actually low in folate, folate and per 100 grams. Um, they have about 16 di dietary folate equivalents per 100 grams. In comparison, the pulses and leafy or cruciferous vegetables have got 100 dietary folate equivalents per 100 grams. That is more than fivefold. So that means to get your daily requirement of 400 microgram per day, which is what you need to minimize DNA damage, you would need to eat two and a half kilograms of root tubers or fruit vegetables to get your folate, as opposed to only 400 grams 
if you ate pulses and leafy or cruciferous vegetables. So, the, so when one gives a recommendation of just eating more fruits and vegetables, it's not good, it's not good enough because you would easily become deficient in folate if you relied on the low folate vegetables. Okay, that is just an example. And we have to take this approach um, with, with all kinds of foods when putting together a recommendation. Okay, so now I'll say a little bit about epigenetics, seeing that we are talking about folate. As I mentioned early on, folate is important because it is a methyl donor. Now, maintenance uh, of, of, of the epigenetic marks is critical. One of the most important epigenetic marks is, is cytosine, methylcytosine, particularly cytosine at CPG islands. Now, in this important schematic diagram by Peter Jones, uh, what he's showing is what happens with aging. With aging, the tumor suppressor or gene suppressor gene promoters or any housekeeping gene, which is essential to maintain good function of cells, is open, right? It, the gene expression is open, it's not suppressed. And that means that the CPG is not methylated, okay? And the histones are acetylated. Or, uh, but the, uh, right. So, whilst other structural and repetitive regions of the of the genome, such as repetitive elements, transposons, and printed genes, as well as be, the pericentromeric parts of the DNA, should be methylated. This is important for suppressing the viral DNA, the transposons, from being expressed, and to maintain good structure of the chromosomes. But with aging, what happens, we get a genetic epigenetic drift. The tumor suppressor uh, promoter regions start, and the housekeeping gene promoters start to become methylated because of damage to the DNA or because of movement of transposons jumping around and landing near the promoters, and the cell tries to silence them. And as a consequence, silence also silences also the normal promoter. And with age, also these important methylations of that keep transposons silent and repetitive elements uh, structurally intact for proper chromosome function, this methylation gets lost and therefore the chromosomes become more fragile and easily broken. Now, in fact, uh, Horvat uh, developed what's using this genetic epigenetic drift, developed a very powerful technique to show the rate of aging in people epigenetically. It's known as the Horvat clock. And he identified 353 promoter CPG sites that very accurately across all organs and tissues um, gives a very tight relationship with aging, right? And using this technique, one can determine how a person is biologically aged relative to their chronological age. Now, in another study, a recent study by Magawa, uh, Magawa showed that this epigenetic drift uh, occurs at a different rate between species, so that those species with a short lifespan, the mice, for example, mouse, for example, has got a high methylation rate per year, while humans have got a very low uh, methylation rate per year relative to the mouse, and the monkey is somewhere in between. Uh, and this epigenetic rate can be observed here uh, through this array of methylation of CPG islands. What they also showed was that it was possible to minimize the rate of epigenetic drift in the mouse by caloric restriction, but not so much in the monkey. And in humans, it may be even perhaps harder, but we don't know enough. And there are emerging evidence how dietary factors can 
prevent the epigenetic drift in humans. And I'll only give one example uh, because I don't, there isn't enough time uh, in the next slide. So one way that the epigenetic drift happens is by DNA damage that occurs, let's say, to environmental pollutants. Um, the exact reason why this happens is not so clear, but it looks like there is an epigenetic response whenever there is damage to DNA for some reason or other. Uh, and certainly it happens because of air traffic pollution. Okay, so PM in this case it comes from the exhaust of motor vehicles. Uh, what they did was they exposed people to PM 2.5 and measured and they did a randomized trial. One of them getting B vitamins uh, supplement of, vit of folate, vitamin B12 and vitamin B6, and others did not. And what they showed was that those who got the supplement of B vitamins had a reduced rate of epigenetic drift of, in these regions of the, of the genome compared to those who uh, did not have the supplement. So there is already evidence that nutritionally it is possible in humans to modify or attenuate the epigenetic drift. So and this is really setting the scene. So the next stage of my presentation, I will be focusing on the personalized nutrition aspects. At this point, I'd just like to mention some take home messages that Nutrients and toxins and foods vary greatly depending on the provenance of the foods and the way they are processed. So for example, by processing, it could be cooking, right? So we know that in meat, for example, you can get uh, genotoxic heterocyclic amines uh, being formed. The next take home message is that specific, specific or multi multiple nutrient deficiencies and caloric intake excesses uh, can have large impacts on genome and epigenome stability. These effects are modified by nutrient-nutrient, nutrient-toxin, and nutrient-genotype interactions. And careful choice of foods, beverages, and dietary patterns is critical to prevent DNA damage and epigenetic drift. At this point, as agreed with Rosina, I'm happy to take maybe two or three questions if, the, if anybody has any pressing questions uh, before moving to the uh, next part of the presentation. Okay. All right. Thank you, Michael. I think um, there's one question from Prof. Uh, Dr. Fadila. So she actually asks um, on nanoparticles. So um, can nanoparticles or nanomaterials cause direct DNA damage? So Michael, what do you think? Yeah. That's a, that's a very good question because nanomaterials are also being used um, in, in uh, foods and in creams that are applied to the skin and so on. So people are worried what happens. Um, yes, in fact, there's a whole field of nanotoxicology that is dedicated to just genetic toxicology. Uh, and we know from these studies um, uh, that nanomaterials um, such as silver and silicon nanomaterials, um, some form of zinc nanomaterials and so on, also um, certain fibers, maybe carbon nanotubes and so on, uh, can cause um, DNA damage and can also cause disrupt the mitotic uh, apparatus. So, for example, one of the well-known nanomaterials are, in fact, asbestos fibers, right? And we know that asbestos fibers can penetrate cells and they can damage the mitotic spindle and cause mass segregation of chromosomes. And this is thought to be one of the mechanisms by which asbestosis causes DNA damage and cancer. Um, there is a whole... Um, field of research and research groups that work on this. Um, but one that is particularly relevant, I guess, amongst the nanomaterials now is microplastics. And microplastics too have been shown to be able to penetrate cells 
they can be visualized under the microscope in the cells and they can have imp impacts uh, of a genotoxic nature uh, as well as cytotoxic nature on the cells. So yes, uh, it is possible, but not necessarily all of them um, are genotoxic. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, there's another question I think um, uh, from the audience. So she would like to know um, about supplement, Michael. So uh, her question is on, is supplement is beneficial to reduce damage of DNA? So what do you think? Yeah, good question. Yeah. So there have been quite a lot of studies done on this as well. The supplements are beneficial. Generally, what we find supplements are beneficial in those who are, who, are, who either have abnormally high levels of DNA damage or who are deficient in that nutrient um, that they are being supplemented with. Those who, who are not deficient typically don't get a benefit out of having a supplement. And it may be that it could also cause them some damage if they have too much. Um, so um, I hope that answers the question. Regarding studies, there have been, uh, we did some reviews on that. Uh, there have been at least um, I would say more than a, more than 120 well-designed, up to I'd say up to 120 well-designed studies, placebo-controlled and prospective studies, show, showing some benefit in reducing DNA damage by supplementation. But if you look at those studies more carefully, where, where this has happened. Um, the benefits were generally in those who had above normal DNA damage levels and or were deficient in that nutrient to begin with. All right, so uh, I think I'll just take another question, another last question, Michael, before you can pose it. There are so many questions. Uh, okay. it's, it's burning question, but I'll just take another one before you can pose it for your next part. Yeah, that's okay. So one of the question is, um, can this damaged DNA be reversed after the um, problems with nutrition treated? So can it be reversed when, uh, example, if it's um, from like B vitamins, et cetera. So if you supplement, can the DNA damage be? Right. Okay. Um, the damage itself cannot be reversed. Um, be because micronuclei, uh, it depends, but in the case of micronuclei, it cannot be reversed because the micronuclei are actually produced as a result of misrepair of the damage that, that caused the micronuclei to begin with. Um, the, the only way to remove the damage is by actually um, the induction of cell death occurring through apoptosis, and that varies between people, um, or because the micronuclei themselves uh, trigger inflammation. We now know that micronuclei uh, leak DNA, and the DNA from micronuclei appears like DNA from a virus. And through the C-gasting pathway, um, the cell uh, response by generating cytokines that attract the innate immune response. If the innate immune response is working well in a person, then the immune system will remove those damaged cells. Okay? The problem is that with aging, the ability of our immune system to remove cells with DNA damage declines, but the cell keeps on sending out the inflammatory signals. And this contributes to the increased inflammation in people with aging, because the rate of damage, as you've seen probably in one of my earlier slides, the number of micronuclei keeps on increasing with age. So the immune system cannot keep up with the amount of damage and cannot remove it entirely. Um, as a consequence, inflammation increases. Um, 
We also know there are studies done in the embryos where the micronuclei keep on being propagated as the, as the fetus grows within the fetus, um, within the embryo. So the only way, therefore, that damage can be removed is, is either through apoptosis or through the immune response. So thank you, Michael. I know there's lots um, of questions. Just one further comment. Yeah. The supplementation can reduce the rate of generation of micronuclei, right? Yeah. It yeah. certainly can do that. And um, so that is possible through, through supplementation. One can reduce the rate of micronuclei and therefore reduce, therefore, the inflammation that comes from the presence of cells with micronuclei. Okay, um, we have other, other questions as well. So I think I'll just keep it towards um, the end of the session. So Michael, yeah. please um, yeah, continue with the second part of the lecture. Thank you. Okay. So now this part of the lecture is about the personalized nutrition. So the idea of personalized nutrition is not entirely new, but certainly it became um, much more important when the field of nutrigenetics came on the scene, uh, research scene some years ago, um, became important because actually nutrigenetics has existed for a long time, as I will explain. Now in nutrigenetics, we mean the ethics and omics for personalized nutrition. So there are also some ethical issues, but I won't go into that. Now, again, it's a similar scheme to the one I showed for nutrigenomics, except in a different way. So through genetics, we can understand the predisposition of an individual to a particular disease or condition. Through epigenetics, we can understand programming. Using this knowledge, we can then think of personalizing a nutritional intervention. So for example, if somebody has got a genetic defect in the ability to absorb zinc or folate, then maybe we can think of a dietary intervention that is personalized to increase the uptake by increasing the intake of those micronutrients. Now, of course, we don't know everything. Therefore, when we do, when we provide personalized nutrition, we want to know whether the advice given actually has worked and has not caused harm. So transcriptomics and proteomics will help to measure the molecular response to the recommendation made or to the extra nutrients taken. And metabolomics and genomic techniques enable, enable us to determine the efficacy and the safety of the recommendation. So if I made a recommendation to a person to take more zinc, I want to make sure that there's no harm being done and that actually, for example, the DNA repair capacity improved. Uh, so it's important to use these DNA damage markers as well as other omic markers to determine the efficacy and safety of the recommendation. Now, as indicated, this idea of nutrigenetics has been with us for quite a while. In fact, uh, one of, in fact, there are some 80 tests done for newborn babies for metabolic uh, uh, disorders uh, that are determined genetically. The one, the original one that was discovered is known as phenylketonuria. It was discovered in 1934 by a Norwegian doctor and biochemist, Ivar Asbjorn Foiling, after testing urine of two mentally challenged siblings. Dr. Foling isolated phenylpyruvic acid from the tested urine and called the disease imbecilitas phenylpyruvate because it uh, caused harmful effects on the intellectual ability of the children who had this high level of phenylpyruvate. Um, so the problem here was eventually it was found that there is a mutation in phenylaniline hydroxylase. So, and this happened when the children had a high dietary protein diet, which resulted in generation of a lot of phenylalanine that could not be 
uh, converted to tyrosine. And as a consequence, um, phenyl acetate and, and phenyl lactate through phenylpyruvate increased in the cell and caused uh, some toxicity relating to defective energy, lipid, nucleic acid, and protein metabolism. And this is now, uh, of course, a standard test in all babies and children. And, uh, and, there, is a, and there is, in fact, a, um, a specific low-protein, low-phenylalanine diet that is recommended to, the, to these children and to prevent the to toxicity and the neurological disorders that come with it. Uh, now, this is unique because this is a relatively simple, uh, as you can see, it's just one, one enzyme, one uh, mutation just in one enzyme and one pathway. And when you have that situation, mutagenetics can work very well indeed. And it's very successful. And as I mentioned, there are at least 80 conditions, metabolic conditions, uh, that where it's important to do and it's practical to do. However, um, in the new field of nutrigenetics, we are moving into uh, beyond, beyond just single uh, unidirectional pathways. We are actually thinking more broadly of um, metabolic cycles, how you can intervene in people who have defects in a metabolic cycle. So there are some enzymes that are involved not just in one pathway, they're involved in multiple pathways, particularly, uh, for example, those enzymes involved in one carbon metabolism, which is the, which is the pathway in which folate operates. Folate acts as a methyl donor. It's present in the blood as 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. This is the form that goes around in the blood and is not stored in the cells. And uh, it can donate its methyl group to homocysteine to make methionine. Methionine is, can be, um, is a methyl donor that, make, that is needed to make acid and acid methionine, which is the methyl donor that enables maintenance or methylation of, let's say, cytosine. Um, now, and uh, it also methylates proteins, lipids, and so on, and regenerates homocysteine, which is toxic if it accumulates. Um, now, when after 5 meter tetrahydrofolate donates its methyl group um, to homocysteine to make methionine, it becomes tetrahydrofolate. And this is further reduced and methylated to make 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate, which is needed to synthesize thymidine and therefore DNA and for DNA synthesis. Now, there's a very important conversion of 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate to 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is critical because this will determine whether folate is available for DNA synthesis or whether it is available for DNA methylation. And the key enzyme here is methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, which requires vitamin B2 or riboflavin as its cofactor. And of course, 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate is its substrate. Now, this is a very important enzyme because it affects a critical part of one carbon metabolism. And it's also the most studied enzyme with regards to its polymorphism. There's a common polymorphism, the C677T polymorphism, uh, which, which slows the activity of this enzyme. And when this enzyme is slowed down, either because of the polymorphism and or because riboflavin is deficient, then 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate cannot be formed and homocysteine accumulates. And as, as you may know, homocysteine is, is a toxic um, amino acid uh, and it needs to be kept lower than 10 micromolar to prevent that toxicity. So, so I'll now focus on just this MTHFR to give you some further idea of how, why it's important. Now, if we look at people, the distribution of people with the, the C677T polymorphism, and we look at the global distribution of homozygotes, you can see here on this world map that the frequency of the homozygotes is 
very different between countries. So for example, China, Italy, Mexico, uh, Venezuela and, uh, and Chile have got very high levels of the homozygotes, 30 to 35% of people uh, have got this uh, mutation. But if you, in Africa, this mutation is almost absent. And it's taught because, as you know, humans emerged out of Africa and the exposure of sunlight uh, can destroy folate, uh, particularly folate in the blood, which is 5-methyl-tetrahydrofolate. Five um, and for this reason, um, it was important to start for uh, early humans to have um, a normal form of MTHFR. Why the homozygote condition increased in other populations is not clear, but one possibility could be because these populations for some reason had a high riboflavin in their diet, and we know the high riboflavin and high folate in the diet uh, counters the deleterious effect of carrying this mutation and therefore allows the mutation to accumulate. Nevertheless, it does mean that within multicultural uh, communities and in specific communities, that there would be people with a very high level of this mutation, with a, there would be a, a substantial proportion of people with this mutation that may require more folate and riboflavin intake to normalize their metabolism and to prevent homocysteine being increased. Now, we tested whether this might be affecting the uh, um, DNA damage, for example, in the South Australian population. We did a cross-sectional study. We measured mutations, not just in MTHFR, but also in GCP2, which is converts the the polyglutamated form of folate in the food to 5 meter tetrahydrofolate with the reduced folate carrier that allows 5 meter tetrahydrofolate into the cell. Meth methionine synthase and methionine synthase reductase also have polymorphisms, which are determined whether 5 meter tetrahydrofolate can or cannot be used in the conversion of homocysteine to methionine, and so on. To cut a long story short, we did actually find a relationship of the micronucleus frequency index with the frequency with polymorphisms in the reduced folate carrier and methionine synthase. So that those who were carriers of the G allele in methionine synthase uh, or the G allele in reduced folate carrier had a lower rate of micronuclei and you can see if you put it in a logical sequence, there is a kind of a, a dose response of those uh, variants, uh, depending how it goes, will either increase or decrease the micronucleus index. However, there was no impact of the MTHFR polymorphism on micronuclei. So we wanted to investigate a bit further through an in vitro model because obviously in vivo, there are many other variables that can impact and might explain the difference. And one of them could be, for example, maybe South Australians have higher riboflavin and therefore they're not so affected or the folate intake is increased. So we tried to model in vitro. Now, you can use in vitro models like this to personalize, to find out which nutrients might benefit the cells of an individual, even if you didn't know their genotype. By by exposing them to different concentrations of nutrients and vit vitamins or minerals, depending on what you're looking at. Now, in this particular experiment, we recruited six, seven individuals who were homozygous for the normal variant of the enzyme, they were CC, and seven who were had the MTHFR C677T, they were homozygotes for it. And we compared these two when, uh, after culturing them in medium, that was either low in folate and low in riboflavin, low in folate and high in riboflavin, high in folate and high in riboflavin, and high in folate and low in riboflavin. And the medium was also 
uh, designed to have a low meth uh, methionine concentration that was physiological, so that will not interfere with the result. Uh, these cultures are done in microplates. You only need 200 microliter cultures to do this. Uh, we did multiples of the same treatment and the same combination. Uh, and the cells were cultured for about eight to nine days, which is the amount of time you need to see the effects on DNA damage level. Um, and therefore, what we could do, therefore, is look at and see if there is an effect of the genotype of folate, which is vitamin B9, whether there was an effect of vitamin B2 riboflavin and their interactions. So if we now look at what the results here, we can see that uh, the results just for the uh, combination of folate and riboflavin uh, in the medium, uh, we could see that higher riboflavin increases genome instability when folate status is low. So uh, if you look at the micronuclei, we can see here that uh, with a high folate medium, the DNA damage was less than with the low folate medium. And there was a tendency for the DNA damage to increase if riboflavin was high, particularly so in the nucleoplasmic bridge biomarker where we achieve statistically significance and for nuclear buds, which is another biomarker of genomic instability. So in, from the study, it was evident that higher riboflavin can increase genome instability under low folate conditions. If we looked at the genotype, it was quite a diverse picture. In terms of the genotype, it appeared that those with, who were homozygous for T tended to have more micronuclei, regardless of whether they were under low or high folate. But they then tended to have lower nuclear buds, um, with uh, uh, if they were homozygous 40. And homocysteine was elevated if, if in the homozygotes, particularly if they were under low folate conditions, which agrees with what we know from uh, in vivo studies. And being homozygous 40 stimulated um, cell growth. So there are clear impacts, both of riboflavin under low folate conditions and of having the uh, mutation for C for MTHFR at the 677 locus. Now, when you do these kinds of studies, these studies are important because they can, from these studies, when you do analysis of variance, uh, statistical analysis, you can then determine the percentage of the variation in the biomarkers affected by, by the factors that you are testing. In this case, the MTHFR polymorphism, the concentration of folic acid, and the concentration of riboflavin. Now, when we look at each of the markers, you can see clearly with micronuclei, the greatest effect was due to micronuclei, about 30% of the variance explained. The impact of, rare, of MTHFR was only 4%, so much smaller, and riboflavin almost had little impact on micronuclei. With nuclear budding, the effect of MTHFR was again not so big, but bigger than with micronuclei, and, uh, and these uh, were affected mainly by folate. With nuclear plasmic bridges, again, folate, low folate concentration was the main contributor, but only explained about 12% variance. The effect of the genotype was small, and the effect of riboflavin was um, relatively higher with nuclear plasmic bridges. Um, with homocysteine, um, the effect of genotype was almost as big as that of folic acid, and riboflavin had some impact. And with the number of cells, in other words, cell growth, uh, again, folic acid was the most important factor followed by the genotype. So it's quite clear that while genotype does have an effect, um, it 
it's not as big as that of folic acid, but it's still there. And the biggest effect is around 10%. Uh, so that's important to bear in mind that maybe the impacts of genotypes when you have a complex pathway may not be as big as when you have just a single pathway uh, uh, as in phenylketonuria. Now, in cross-sectional uh, population studies, you can also uh, look at these interactions between gene and nutrient um, by studying a particular health outcome and then testing whether that health outcome varied by diet and whether it was impacted by the genotype. So if you imagine you have, if you're looking at a particular gene and a mutation, and there's some tendency for the G carriers, let's say, to have a maybe a stronger effect with this particular health outcome, let's say blood pressure. Um, and in that, in that community or in that intervention, there were two different diets being analyzed then it may be that the effect happened only in people um, who were carriers of the G allele, and it only occurred with diet two, uh, but did not occur with diet one, right? Maybe because uh, that nutrient, they were more sensitive uh, to a specific dietary pattern or, or nutrient in that second diet. Sometimes if you, however, you might look at a particular mutation and not see any impact of the genotype. It does not seem in the population that there's a difference. However, if you stratify the population depending on the diet pattern or, the, or a particular nutrient, it could be that um, one particular genotype um, has a reduction in the health outcome whilst the other genotype actually has a benefit in the health outcome, creating an opposite effect, but still generating a significant interaction either way. And in the next slide, there's just an example of this. This is a study done in the Boston Puerto Rican health study, where they looked at a variant in MAT1A, which is an enzyme that converts methionine, methionine to S-adenosyl methionine, a methylating agent. And they looked at vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 is a cofactor needed to convert homocysteine to cysteine and to glutathione, which is an antioxidant. The effect they looked at was oxidation of guanine, which they measured in the urine. And what they found was exactly this kind of opposite direction of effect, uh, such that when vitamin B6 was high, only those who were A carriers exhibited a reduction in the oxidation of guanine, guanine while those who were um, G homozygotes actually had a trend uh, in the opposite direction, as seen here. Another example, this time in terms of a, of a particular diet, a Mediterranean diet, uh, with respect to the probability of remaining diabetes-free, those individuals that had the G allele for this variation in the clock gene uh, ex experienced a benefit in that um, the probability of remaining uh, type 2 diabetes free was much better for them compared to the CC homozygotes, whilst in the control group, as you, uh, there was no difference between the two. So clearly, there was a benefit of the Mediterranean diet only for those who were G carriers. Now, there are many examples like this, and there are many groups and companies who would like, and in fact are already using and commercializing this knowledge uh, to provide genotype-based dietary advice. Uh, however, uh, this has been done somewhat haphazardly, and thankfully now we have some guidelines uh, and these are, these are the guidelines, for example, that came out of the Food for Me project uh, and the, through the NUGO, the European Nutrigenomics Organization. Um, uh, I was lucky that our group was uh, involved in this as, as well. And these are more or less the guidelines. So the guidelines are there to provide a framework for assessing the evidence of scientific validity of giving pers personalized dietary advice based on genotype. 
the most important rating scores are really the study quality. In other words, it had to have a good study design, which would be either a um, randomized placebo-controlled trial, interventional, or uh, and as was prospective study, and it had to be properly controlled. Um, it depended on the type of gene by diet interaction, whether it was a direct interaction or intermediate, whether the what was the nature of the genetic variant, was the genetic uh, mutation clearly causal, in other words, it, it reduced the uh, function of the enzyme, or was it just an associated genetic variant? Um, and, and it is associated, and, but it's known that that, that causes a, a functional effect. Or was it associated genetically, but has an unknown function, then that is not good evidence. Is it biologically plausible? In other words, was the effect would, on the enzyme strong enough to produce a metabolic disturbance that would be pathological? And, the, and what is the overall scientific validity score? Is it convincing, probable, or possible? And the recommendation is that only those that are convincing uh, really should be uh, used um, in these recommendations. Now, what is emerging uh, uh, is a stronger awareness now that while genetics is important, it is not the only uh, factor that can um, predict the outcome of a nutritional recommendation or a nutritional intervention. And therefore, a broader view uh, is being taken of identifying people and classifying responders and non-responders um, based on a broader application of the omics technology. So it is not just the genomics, but it is also metabolomics. And that could be metabolomics uh, of different pathways. It could be nucleotide metabolism, could be carbohydrate metabolism, it could be metabolism of complex lipids or just energy metabolism. Or it could be, of course, uh, the uh, effects occurring not just in the body, but it could also be in the microbiome. Now, metabolomics, of course, can be relatively simple or very complex. Now, for example, if we take one carbon metabolism, we know that there's a metabolic signature to distinguish deficiency in B vitamins involved in one carbon metabolism. So, for example, just by using three metabolites, homocysteine, formate, and methylmalonic acid, one can diagnose vitamin B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, B6 deficiency, or riboflavin deficiency. So, in the case of v vitamin B12 deficiency, homocysteine, formate, and methylmalonic acid are all increased, while in the case of, let's say, vitamin B6 deficiency, uh, only homocysteine is increased, and so on. Now, of course, it can become more and more complex, and certainly this is the case if one is studying obesity and diabetes uh, and lipids and glycation and so on, you can end up with a with a table of more than 20, even 40, if not 60 biomarkers. Now, what has been suggested in this very nice paper by Donovan, Donovan et al., um, which was part also of the Food for Me study, was that one could use metabotyping for the delivery of personalized nutrition. The idea really is to use to look at the metabolites in a group of people and use those metabolites to see if they cluster into specific groups using the K-means cluster analysis protocol. Um, and they did this in, in one of their cohorts and showed that they could divide people in three clusters in Europe. Um, Cluster one had the lowest triglycerides, the highest HDL cholesterol, and the lowest glucose. Um, cluster two was uh, identified simply by having the lowest total cholesterol. And cluster three had the highest triglycerides, 
uh, total cholesterol, lowest HDL and highest glucose. And they suggested that one could, on this basis, give personalized, and uh, based on their levels, give uh, targeted uh, 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 advice uh, based on their markers. And they showed that, on, that this advice matched very much that that uh, dietitian might have uh, advised based on their nutrient intake. And they recommended that this might also be a way of identifying those people who are responders and non-responders in an intervention, as shown in this second in this next slide. Now, the idea is basically is this: we know that uh, when a, a dietary intervention is performed, even if it is statistically significant, typically only about forty to fifty percent of the subjects actually responded in a positive manner, in a beneficial manner to the intervention. And then about um, another 30 or 40% might have had no effect from the intervention or benefit, and the rest uh, actually experienced an adverse effect. And the idea is, well, if, if one could cluster these people based on who are the responders and non-responders and, uh, and, and how they respond uh, and tested them also um, across a number of diet, dietary options, then one could build a predictive profile to tell whether an individual fitted within a particular cluster that responded or fitted in a, another cluster that actually had an adverse or no effect. And in this manner, through an iterative process, build a predictive profiling database uh, that could then increasingly uh, predict with better accuracy the outcome for an individual and provide more stringent and safer advice. So the idea here is essentially summarized uh, in this slide. So basically the metabolome in body fluids and tissues is measured by various means. And now these days there are many, many means to do that, especially with mass spectrometry. This can be done very quickly and, and uh, a very detailed metabolome can be determined. Uh, the metabolome can be used to identify those with high risk for disease and therefore it's valuable in itself because the metabolome also provides prognostic markers of disease. But it can also be used to identify cases responsive to a specific nutrient or dietary pattern or nutrient combination. And this is of course valuable in the field of personalized and precision nutrition. Now, uh, this in fact has already happened and is increasingly happening uh, so that the ability to translate this becomes uh, more important. So one of the most important studies was this done by Zivi et al, reported in 2015, where they wanted to study the glycemic response of about 800 people to various foods. And they basically gave them each food, I don't know, it might have been eight or 10 different foods, and then they measured their glucose levels after eating the, the foods. And they also measured in these people the, their microbiome, in other words, the profile of their bacteria and the gut. They did a wide range of blood tests relating to glucose and lipid metabolism and other measures. They had a dietary questionnaire to know what their dietary background is. They measured their height, waist, hip ratio, and so on get an idea of their size, and they ask them to keep a food diary. Using all of this data, uh, they could, I, they built a knowledge base that could then allow them to predict the response of people to different foods. Uh, and some people responded in a very different manner than you would have normally expected, uh, despite, and that's because the data from previous interventions were not really indicating uh, clearly that 
the extent of the adverse responses uh, that were happening. Uh, but through this mechanism, uh, through this database of more than 800 people, and I think there was also a, a repeat study on a smaller group verifying it, uh, a big enough database was built. And of course, this is growing as it is uh, commercialized and the data accumulated. Now, let's have... Uh, now, in that previous study, the microbiome played an important role in the prediction. Um, but this is not always the case. But nevertheless, why is the microbiome important? Because we know that bacteria intervene depending and make different metabolites in the gut depending on whether there's a poor quality diet, which is predominantly animal driven protein, derived protein, too much saturated fats, refined grains, sugar, salt, alcohol, and corn derived fructose. Uh, whilst the healthy diet was predominantly plant-based uh, with monounsaturated and entry PUFAs tends to favor a healthy microbiome. And this can create, make a, quite a big difference to uh, one's well-being and health. The other, this, the microbiome itself, as well as other factors, um, genetic and non-genetic factors, such as age and the nature of a meal and so on, can have a strong impact on the postprandial um, response to glucose, uh, insulin, and uh, in terms of glucose, insulin, and lipid, lipids in the blood after eating a particular food. And this therefore highlights the need to really uh, be more careful and, and understanding of what things can change. Now, for example, in the, in the gut, the microbiome can produce certain um, metabolites that are either beneficial or toxic. So fiber can generate short chain fatty acids, which are needed for the health of the gut epithelia and also for uh, short chain fatty acids also uh, generate acetates that have epigenetic effects uh, um, by acetylating histones, for example. Um, they can also, uh, short chain fatty acids affect the epithelial cells to generate uh, signaling molecules like IL-18, which is pro-inflammatory, pro or GLP-1 and PYY, which send signal, signals to the brain about food intake and energy expenditure. Some dietary um, um, some, di some nutrients like carnitine, choline, and phosphatidylcholine, which are rich in meat, for example, uh, can be metabolized by certain bacteria to TMAO, which is toxic and, uh, and favors atherogenesis and therefore increases cardiovascular disease. Um, some proteins can be metabolized to indole derivatives that uh, affect the immune response. Um, other ones, um, such as phenylalanine, can be metabolized to phenyl acetate, which we know from phenylketonuria is toxic to cells and to the brain, but also damages the liver. <coughs> Alcohol is converted to acetaldehyde, which is a class one genotoxin and harms the liver. And also there is some evidence emerging that the conversion of tyrosine to 4-EPS uh, generates autistic behaviors, at least in animal models, and therefore could be relevant to human autism. Uh, this nice paper by Kolodziek uh, provides a nice scheme here, uh, how all of this richness of data can be used for personalized nutrition, so the clinical parameters, the microbiome composition, the genetics, as well as the lifestyle and personal goals of the individual. What, you know, what are they after? Are they after disease control, um, preventing uh, disease from happening or optimizing some aspect of, of life style, such as cognitive function or exercise? Anyway, all of this information uh, now through machine learning, this is a computerized uh, analysis, detailed analysis, of this data to generate personalized advice, maybe to make some changes, such as changing the microbi microbiologically produced metabolites, changing the composition of the microbiota, 
or changes in the physiology of the gut. And of course, some examples would be here, disease control could be normalization of glucose levels. Prevention of atherosclerosis may be by reduction of TMAO, could be a prophylactic approach. And optimizing energy utilization may be beneficial for athletes. Now, this year has been reported a very important study known as PREDICT-1 Precision Nutrition Twin Study. This study is unique is because they involved as a large part of this cohort of 1,000 people, 1,200 people, 100 people, the main cohort being 1,000 in the UK, 100 in the US. Well, the main important difference of this particular cohort study was that they included um, a large proportion of the participants were identical twins and non-identical twins. And this helps also to, uh, um, um, to determine the genetic impact relative to other uh, omic markers. So the genomic, uh, genetic um, information relative to the metabolomic information, uh, as well as in, uh, in the context also of uh, the other information of anthropometry, in other words, the size of the particular individual, their waist separation, as well as all the other information about the composition of the foods and what the people are eating. Uh, they were exposed to two standard meals, not single foods in this case, standard meals, and uh, they were uh, they 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 were the metabolites were measured in a fasting state as well as postprandially up to um, uh, up to three hundred and sixty minutes. Um, the outcomes of the study were actually very interesting. Uh, first of all, you can see here on the left-hand side, the top panel here with these lines, this is the triglyceride response. At the bottom panel here, with this, the glucose response, you can see there's a large variation in the responses of people. But the important piece of information really is what was the percentage variation explained by these various markers that they measured and how, what were they relative to each other? So if you look at the... Um, here, if we look at the microbiome, the microbiome was not the strongest predictor of triglycerides in, uh, in, in the study. And neither was it of glucose. It was generally in the top half of the markers, but not the top one. Um, so the predictor or the, or the marker that explained most of the variance were serum lipid markers for triglycerides and meal composition for glucose. Genetics was the second largest factor in terms of predicting uh, the, the, the amount of the variance explained uh, for glucose, but it wasn't, it was in fact the lowest for triglycerides. And so on, you can see also age is a factor uh, towards the lower half. Uh, gender is clearly a factor in triglycerides, but it was the lowest factor for glucose. So the key points were that uh, in these 1,000 uh, and two twins and unrelated healthy adults in the UK, um, there was observed a large inter-individual variability, coefficient of variation between 60 and 103% following identical meals. The effect of baseline characteristics assessed, well, in this case, the person-specific factors such as gut microbiome had great influence, uh, but great had the greater influence, but it was only 7.1% of the variance. Uh, and, and it was greater than the effect of mean macronutrients or postprandial lipemia, but this wasn't the case for, li for glycemia. Genetic variants, uh, these are uh, single nucleotide polymorphism variants, only had a modest impact on the predictions. So the highest being 9.5% for glucose and only 0.8% for triglycerides and 0.2% for C-peptide. If they looked at the effect of being a twin or not, then the genetic effect, uh, for example, for glucose was much greater. It was up to 45%. 
but generally, of course, in the way the genetic uh, advice is provided, it's through the polymorphism effect. Now, when they looked at the correlations here between the predicted triglyceride, for example, and the measured triglyceride, uh, in the UK and US validation cohort, you can see there is a highly significant correlation, high, a very high low p-value, but, but the correlation factor is still weak. It's only about 0.47. It was higher for glucose. The correlation factor was about 0.75 or 0.77, both in the UK and the US cohort. But what they stated in the paper was that the modest heritability of postprandial traits means that even in an unrealistically optimistic scenario in which most of this trait variance is explained by known DNA variants, it is unlikely that prediction algorithms using DNA variant data alone, which many direct-to-consumer nutrigenomics company, companies advocate, would succeed. So what they're really saying is you cannot just use the, in, uh, genetics uh, to make predictions. You should also use uh, other omic markers um, to, uh, to make uh, predictions and to identify responders and non-responders. Now, actually, the, the person who suggested this originally, this concept originally, was Michael Snyder from, from Stanford University in the US, who over a year actually measured himself in all kinds of omic ways, uh, whilst he changed his diet, got ill, recovered, and so on. Um, and uh, he suggested that all of these omic uh, data, the genome, the methylome, the microbiome, transcriptome, metabolome, and so on, can be integrated into this integrated personal omics profile. Um, and this internet, uh, integrated personal omics profile can be used to provide some personalized recommendations. And that this is, should be iterated throughout life. And the database uh, through machine, learn, machine learning um, becomes more and more refined in its prediction. Um, a few years later, um, uh, Sherry Ann Brown uh, took, expanded these ideas or rather presented them in another way, how they could be used in, uh, in uh, medical practice, in precision and systems medicine. Uh, again, used, uh, utilizing these uh, omics data to generate through network biology computational models to, this, to basically construct what uh, she calls an avatar. So in other words, like in the avatar movie, an equivalent of yourself. Um, uh, and that this model can then be used, the super model can be used to predict your responses to different um, uh, nutrients, medicines, and uh, so on. So as you can see, the concepts are really quite exciting. The, the, the ability to put this together is available uh, in some uh, institutions, more so in some than in others, but the concepts can be applied on a smaller scale, even uh, where, uh, where it becomes practical to start considering developing this uh, in different areas. And here, this is virtually my final slide, just giving an idea of the opportunities for personalized precision nutrition. Uh, this can be targeted depending on your speciality on fertility and the first 1,000 days of development. It can be specialized for immune function. There's a lot of interest now on the nutritional uh, advice, for example, for improving immune function to fight the COVID-19 virus, uh, for metabolic disorders such as diabetes and obesity, for cardiovascular disease prevention, neurodegenerative disease prevention, particularly, for example, in Alzheimer's 
and targeting, let's say, those who carry the ApoE4 genotype. In terms of lung function, this again is particularly relevant with regards to inflammation. It's also relevant to COVID-19 and uh, mortality from that condition in relation to digestive excretory functions and in relation to cancer prevention, as well as cancer survivorship in those who have been diagnosed and treated, and also in terms of preventing recurrence of cancer in cancer survivors. So I simply now conclude with some take home messages. Uh, it is indeed possible to use genotype information to identify responders, non-responders, and adverse responders to specific single nutrients or single pathways, as for example, in the uh, phenylketonuria uh, situation. Multi-omic deep phenotyping is a versatile approach to capture nutrient, metabolome, microbiome profile which comprehensively reflects an individual's nutrient, nutrient, and nutrient genome, epigenome, and one could say microbiome interactions. Evidence from controlled interventions suggests that a multi-omic approach is needed to develop strong predictive models of individual metabolic response to specific foods or meals. Excuse me. Well, the truth is we are still on a steep learning curve, but it's an exciting learning curve and there's certainly a great future in this uh, knowledge. Hopefully it can be delivered uh, in an effective way and in a way that is not too expensive, uh, that it cannot be implemented um, so that everybody can benefit. So here is just an example of what might happen in a restaurant in the future or it might not be at a restaurant it could be in a hospital wherever you are eating considering your nutriomic avatar i recommend the fish of the day with soybeans forming course only one glass of wine berries for dessert or a strong coffee to finish so in fact this is the end of my presentation and I would simply like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. And I look forward to your questions and interactions. Karima, Kasi, many thanks. Okay, so thank you, Michael. Um, I welcome questions if they have, um, because now is question and answer session. So I do welcome questions. If you are shy, you can put it in chat box. So let me start with um, some of the questions that um, you have a response, uh, it's in the chat box, Michael. So uh, one of the questions coming from our Dean, because um, I think in one of your slides, you did mention there's like um, some sort of formulation uh, for um, the type of diet to maintain genome health and zinc is not part of it. So I was just wondering, is there any formulation to, I mean, to formulate mm -hmm. good, a functional food or like a poly pill itself to like to cover whole nutrients that is important for genome health. I mean, your comment? Yeah. On <clears throat> yeah. Um, in that particular slide, that particular slide uh, related just to the South Australian population. Okay. So in that particular study, zinc did not, um, in fact, come up as and the multiple regression analysis didn't come up as being important in the South Australian population. That doesn't mean it isn't important, right? Um, because in fact, we found, in fact, this was also part of Rosina's uh, studies, was that um, if we gave zinc uh, to those who were low on zinc, right, it did help uh, reduce the DNA damage. So that's why I was saying at the beginning, uh, the efficacy depends on, on the nutrient status of the individual. Now, in fact, um, the, the role of zinc is important and I would classify zinc as one of those nutrients you would need in a supplement 
to put if you are putting together a supplement for DNA damage prevention. Okay. Um, the criteria of how you would choose those is, you know, have not been um, developed yet. Okay. Um, but um, these criteria are important. Um, I've written about it. Uh, first of all, we need to determine uh, the dietary reference values for DNA damage prevention. In 2010, I wrote a review in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition about this concept of DNA of nutrient reference values for genome stability for prevention of genome damage. Um, and we need to, uh, there are reviews that have been written. Uh, we wrote uh, one or two of these reviews on interventions um, that reduce the micronucleus index. Um, and uh, we are uh, writing um, another one in this regard as well. There are other groups who are also writing reviews in terms of, let's say, specific aspects of DNA damage. Uh, such as telomere length, uh, you'll find there's three or four reviews. We wrote one of those as well. Um, and, and we know, so we know we have a good idea which nutrients are important, as shown in that slide at the beginning. Uh, there are, there would be at least, you know, half a dozen vitamins, maybe four or five minerals and so on that you could claim have, uh, some role in genome protection. Uh, but I'll give you another example. For example, we did an intervention with selenium. And now we know that selenium in selenium deficient countries uh, is a, uh, supplementing with selenium is important and that might also have an, an effect on DNA integrity. But when we did that intervention, for example, in South Australia, it was completely negative. We measured everything possible we could think of where selenium is important, and it came out negative. And the reason was that uh, South Australians, uh, because of the, I guess, the presence of selenium in the soil here, um, are not deficient. Um, so yeah, so the, the problem, the bit that we don't know is, that we don't know enough about is what level, what is the high level where, there is no benefit or there might actually be some harm, right? And for example, with uh, that varies from one nutrient to the other. Um, so with folate, you know, the, the level of the, re, the range that is safe in this regard is quite wide. But if we take, for example, zinc, it's quite narrow. Right, we, you, the zinc's got to be in the region of four to 16 micromolar. So one has to be maybe a bit more careful in that case. In selenium, it's a bit wider. So that's the bit. So there's still some lack of knowledge uh, to be certain. We can certainly identify the nutrients that have got a role in DNA damage maintenance and, 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 good replication of DNA, uh, but we know less about the concentration that might cause harm if it is in excess. And this is one of the issues with supplementation, that we have to be careful that no harm is done. Remember, that's part of the, a key part of the Hippocratic Oath, that no harm is done. So some caution is needed. Yeah, I think a long way to go, right, Michael? But of course, we need to start somewhere, because at the end of oh yeah, yeah. yeah, we need to we need to start somewhere. And as long as we, as the doses that are recommend that are that are put in a supplement, are yeah. within a safe range, mm -hmm. then it's it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. All right. So there's there no are supplements, by the way. You asked the question whether there are supplements. Um, there are supplements uh, that have been produced in this manner. Um, uh, and there are actually patents. There are pa um, groups that have issued patents um, in relation to a combination. Mm. 
Okay. So soon it can be um, commercialized, is it? Yeah, well, some of these supplements are also being sold already. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, there's another question on, I think, more to options to organic foods because I think this person actually care about pesticide residue and all these chemicals yeah. that might actually counteract with the DNA and cause all these harmful effects. So any comments on that um, about organic food and how it can help to reduce DNA damage maybe? Yeah. So um, I, it's a very important question. The reason it's important is because plants can grow in soils, um, for example, in soils that have he heavy metals in them. Mm. And they can survive and grow and thrive. So if you lived in a country where, where you're eating a lot of, let's say, uh, fruits and vegetables in particular, right, um, where the soil is contaminated, uh, you think you're doing the right thing by eating those foods, right? but you're going to contaminate your body with the heavy metals. Um, I mean, even for example, uh, here in South Australia, we have a region where there is a, a lead, um, uh, there's some lead con contamination in the environment and uh, it's not high, but you can, in the people in the surrounding areas, they can measure the lead levels. And we know that lead is one of the environmental factors that we know for sure increases micronuclei, right? So, so it can happen anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, pesticides, of course, are another important factor. Um, uh, some pesticides can accumulate in the body, particularly those pesticides that accumulate in fat. Um, and these become uh, important issues um, so how, how do we know or, or we don't know? The thing is we have to measure. So the, what, uh, through the HOMN project, the Human Micronucleus project, we have for many years now, um, we are into our 22nd year since its founding, 23rd year since its founding, um, <clears throat> been promoting the, um, laboratories around the world to measure the baseline damage rates in their populations using the micronucleus index in our case and, uh, and to determine what are those variables that affect or it can explain the, the frequency of micronuclei in their population, right? Uh, that's the only way you're going to know what are the factors that matter. Um, and ideally, one also has the environmental factors, not just the nutrients. So there was one slide I didn't show. I, I, I might be able to show it if that's okay. Let's see, I can, here it is. This one here. This is a very interesting study where they did what's called the environmental wide association study. So instead of doing a genome-wide association study to determine, to find out what are the genetic factors causing a disease, they use the same technique, just using the environmental factors that people were exposed to. Now this included um, dietary factors, as well as these, or these chemical uh, contaminants like phthalates, phenols, hydrocarbons, heavy metals, furans, dioxins, and so on, in relation to type 2 diabetes. And actually what they showed was, um, here you can see that the, the carotenes were associated with a reduced risk, 0.6, Gamma tocopherol, for some reason, is associated with an increased risk, 1.8, 1.6. Heptachloroxide and PCBs were both associated with high increased risks of 4.5, 2.3, 3.2, and 1.8, right? So this kind of study 
So this is an environmental-wide association study, which therefore relates to the, what's called the exposome. Uh, if that kind of study could be linked with a DNA damage biomarker study, uh, then you would be able to determine the, the contribution of these factors. Mm. Um, so if the disease, let's say, was DNA damage instead of type 2 diabetes, you could I then identify the relative importance of these factors in your population. Okay. All right. Great. Um, there's another question on telomia, Michael. So uh -huh. uh, will nutrition affect the shortening of telomia? I think you did share this before. And yeah. it speed up aging. Yes. Yes. So we know that uh, nutrition does affect telomere length. Um, Probably the best evidence is for um, the Mediterranean diet has got the strongest evidence so far of being associated with longer telomeres. Um, but the situation with telomeres is uh, kind of a bit complicated, I should say. Um, well, let's start for, for example, what we mean by telomere shortening. So when do telomeres become a problem uh, in terms of their length? The, the reason there is a telomere is it's a hexamer repeat, a TTA, GGG repeat. Um, that is, it's there so that at the end of the chromosome, this repeat can form a loop called the T-loop. And the telomere has got to be long enough to make the T-loop. So it doesn't actually have to be very long. Uh, because if it doesn't make the T-loop, it will look like a broken uh, a DNA strand break. And if it looks like a DNA strand break, it will be recombined through homologous combinational repair. And it will then uh, be recombined with another broken chromosome, with another chromosome with a short telomere. And, uh, and form a dicentric chromosome, which cannot be segregated properly during mitosis. And that creates what's known as the breakage fusion bridge cycle, which I briefly mentioned at the beginning, uh, which generates a recurring genomic instability. Uh, so that becomes a big, big problem. So, um, so even if the telomeres, if you are shortened a bit, it's not a problem as long as the cell, it's long enough to make the T loop. And it doesn't have to be, I don't know how many repeats you need. You need maybe a hundred repeats, which is not long at all. Um, now, however, if you have a break in a chromosome, which can happen, for example, if you are folate deficient or, or because of exposure to ionizing radiation, let's say, then when there's a break in the chromosome, when you lose that fragment of that chromosome, you lose the telomere as well. So you can lose your, so when there is a micronucleus caused by a fra a chromosome fragmentation, that means you've lost a telomere um, and so on. So uh, now the problem is that with many of the assays, they measure, they measure the telomere content in the nuclei. And you won't be able to see that there is a, a telomere lost when you do that in a nucleus. And therefore the information is kind of diluted by all the other chromosomes that haven't lost the telomere. So the, a more but more uh, a more laborious but but more accurate method is to look at the metaphase chromosomes and and identify the number of chromosomes with telomere loss. In other words, there isn't a signal of the telomere. Um, telomere lengthening can happen also if under conditions of hypomethylation. Um, and however, that is, that is not a healthy telomere lengthening. So the, the, when the telomeres become too long, um, they, they, um, when the telomeres become too long, they actually become a target for DNA damage. And this is the very interesting part of it. So when 
the guanine in telomere is, is oxidized or there is a break in, in the telomere, it remains unrepaired. So these breaks in the telomere do not get repaired. Uh, gamma H2AX will identify them and bind to them, but they remain unrepaired. And what happens is these un persistent uh, breaks in the telomere creates what's called a persistent DNA damage response, which activates the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. In other words, that cell starts to uh, send out these chemokines to bring the immune system in to generate inflammation in the hope that the immune system will remove those cells. Um, so what happens is uh, by having it's not good to have telomeres that are too long because they become a target of damage and you don't want them to be extremely short because they won't function. Mm. Um, so this is the issue. So by you can elongate telomeres by hypomethylation of, of DNA. Um, that happens. But that is not healthy lengthening. That is simply making the telomere longer than it needs to be and therefore a target for DNA damage and persistent DNA damage response. Okay. So right. the inflammation of aging is, apart from being related to micronuclei, is also related to persistent DNA damage response due to damage in the telomere. Okay. All right. I think second to last question, uh, Michael, because I cannot take, uh, there are so many questions, but I think I just have another two questions. Um, one of the questions is, uh, she wanted to know, I think Dr. Hannah is actually the person who are working in autistic um, research field. So mm -hmm. is there any um, future for personalized nutrition for autistic um, population? Um, I'd say in principle, uh, there is. Um, I remember some years ago, uh, we had quite a few families come and and see us and talk to us because they were getting all of this advice from doctors and health professionals, a whole book of suggestions, and they didn't know what to do with it. And I don't think even the clinicians knew what to do with it because they were trying to get all of this, uh, these genetic markers measured and so on. And uh, we, we did a, a small project on autism. Um, we could not find really an association between uh, autism and uh, DNA damage in that particular study. But we did some systematic reviews, a couple of them. Uh, this was Penny Main who did those reviews. And, um, and uh, there were some plausible associations with uh, uh, defects in the glutathione and, and maybe the one carbon metabolism pathways. Um, there is also, of course, as I mentioned, there's this metabolite uh, that's generated by the uh, bacteria, uh, for which I, I know that was another group that found some evidence also to support that uh, some changes in the microbiome in autistic children. But whether that was the cause of autism itself uh, is difficult to, to know. It's a field I haven't explored any further because we we really didn't think we could uh, our focus of research could not contribute more than what we had done at that point uh, but it's certainly a field that is worthwhile revisiting um, uh, but and one could develop i guess in theory could possibly develop a program yeah. uh, of personalized nutrition uh, if, if, the, if the plausibility um, mechanistically is there. Mm, okay. I think last question um, from a company perspective, uh, Michael. So do you think how ready is um, public to take personalized nutrition as a new way into their lifestyle? Because as you know, it's not cheap, especially here in Malaysia. So yeah. um, how long do you think it will take us to, um, to reach that stage, I guess? 
it depends on the population themselves, right? I'm not sure. What do you think? Well, I think, you know, you can make something as complicated as you like. But mm. uh, I guess the, the first thing is to understand what is the most important um, health issue that people are looking for a solution, right? Um, and then uh, try to implement something that is not expensive, so expensive to implement, that is affordable. Um, I'll give you an example. So um, if we looked at the metabolome of, uh, of the B vitamins, right? Of, of folate, B12, B6, and B2, yeah? Um, you only would only need to measure three metabolites, okay, to be able to diagnose what the limitation is. Uh, and that may be something, uh, you know, that is affordable if it was and if it was important, right? Um, in terms of obesity, um, you know, something there may, may be important implemented as well uh, in terms of you know a shifting to shifting to a plant-based natural diet something like that um, but uh, yeah you in I, I guess one would have to look at uh, what are the opportunities and of those opportunities, which ones are easiest to translate? Because once you have a success with a, with a small um, project and you, can, and you can show that it is translatable in practice uh, within the community, right? Um, then, uh, and it is within reach that can be delivered, you know, to the great majority of people. Then I think you've got, you've got um, a chance of, of success, of translation. All right. That's uh, the question? Yeah, yeah. I think um, sort of, yeah. So uh, thank you so much. I know we have so many other questions, but I, uh, due to time, I believe that I think we can always ask Michael um, in another session, All right, Michael? Yeah, we yeah, do that's have... fine. I'll be more than happy to do that. Okay. All right. Um, so I think we, on behalf of the faculty, thank you so much, Michael, for sharing your knowledge and passion in um, your research. So we, uh, everybody learns a lot here. Everybody gets inspired. So. Um, Take home message, I think, more to like, we need to think back about our nutrition and how, what kind of our diet can actually maintain our genome health and how ready are we in terms of personalized nutrition. So um, I think that's it. Michael, do you want to add anything? Any last word from you? Um, no, I'd just like to thank you all for the very nice questions, uh, insightful and important questions. I hope I've uh, provided some useful answers and I look forward to uh, further interaction with the faculty. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Michael. So if you can uh, stop sharing, so mm -hmm. Isa can share the QR code again. So to those attendees, please scan your QR code to get um, a spell. So uh, thank you so much. Please use uh, the MyUKM uh, for the QR code and uh, thank you Michael so we shall see you again in another session thank you I'll okay just, uh, Thanks, uh, thank you Michael bye bye okay thank you so you can leave the session okay okay untuk semua mohon scan QR code so that kita ada record for e spell Thank you. Untuk UKM uh, staff only. So uh, those outside from UKM, you don't have to scan this QR code. And also for um, students.
And thank you so much, everyone, for participating. I'm so sorry I cannot read every single question, but I do hope everybody actually learned a lot from this session. I know it's a bit technical, but I think um, it's a good uh, sharing session from uh, in our international distinguished professors. So thank you so much for joining and participating in the um, sharing session. Thank you. Faiza boleh cekkan QR code ni ada yang cakap invalid QR code. Mohon secretary bantu in terms of QR code. Okay, sekejap kita minta sekretari bantu untuk QR code. Faizah and Puan Haida boleh bantu? Boleh cuba lagi sekali tak? Saya dah refresh. Faiza boleh bantu teknikal ni ada yang kata still tak working lah Faiza tapi ada yang boleh macam mana eh? uh, tu lah saya buat tadi boleh yang ni dah masuk ramai dah ni Itulah, tapi ada beberapa yang tak boleh so I'm not sure what happen. Any tips ke boleh buat manual ke ataupun? Uh, kami tak boleh nak masukkan sebab kalau masuk manual kami perlu kata laluan. Oh okay. Uh, so tak apa, boleh tinggalkan number dekat, uh, ni tak dekat chat box. Nanti saya serah kepada Puan Rahida lah untuk daftarkan. Okay. Uh, yang tak dapat tu. Uh, yang sebelum-sebelum ni saya dah catat. Uh, cuma yang terbaru ni lah Start okay. daripada Jam berapa tadi Itulah ada yang dah dapat Ada yang tak dapat So I'm not sure um, Kenapa Ada yang dah berjaya Alhamdulillah 
Tunggu lima minit. Okay, kena cuba jangan give up. Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, kita jangan give up. QR code kena scan. Penting ni. Okay, yang mana dah scan QR code, dah boleh leave, dah boleh pergi makan, boleh buat kerja lain. Terima kasih. So, uh, eh kenapa semua tinggalkan nombor phone ni? You minta nombor phone ke? Tak. <laughs> Confuse, confuse. Kenapa semua tinggalkan nombor phone? Oh no. Oh, Dr. Vanita tak boleh. Oh. Okay, Cik Ikan ni akhirnya boleh. Terbanita. Ah, Hani terus keluar Hani. Ah, uh, so nama you terus jadi banyak tu. Vanita, Dr. Vanita ni macam mana ni Fai? I think um. Apa? Uh, Dr. Vanita nanti kita daftarkan ni lah. Okay. Ni ada tips daripada Cik Gan. Uh, mungkin sesak sikit kena tunggu sekejap. Bersabar dan keep on scanning. Kita nak tunggu lagi eh. Sekejap uh, saya cuba keluar dah. Gigihnya Vanita, okey. Cik Yusman, kita nak tunggu, kita bagi masa lah kan untuk QR code ni. Boleh Dato, boleh, boleh. Kita bagi masa. Baik. Ah, Dr. Vanita dah ada. Akhirnya tahniah Vanita. <laughs> Aku pula happy.
I think saya boleh lift lah kan. Saya so, boleh. Eh, boleh. Saya masih tak dapat alamat kesannya Hidayah. Hidayah guna UKM app tak? I think uh, tips tadi ada yang keluar masuk balik and ada yang scan banyak kali. Ha, tak apa doktor, nanti kita entertain ya, macam mana kita tengok macam mana. Alright, okay thank you. Okay. Yusman, um, apps, and, uh, smart attendant ni Asal kita orang UKM dia memang boleh ni kan? Uh, macam mana, macam mana? Kalau kita uh, UKM, kita boleh je kan daftar kan? Even though kita student ke daftar kan? sebab ada student kata dia kata dia pengguna luar tak boleh tak boleh guna ah uh, sepatutnya dia boleh pakai lah sebab dia kalau dia pakai my uh, my UKM punya apps tu sepatutnya uh. dia boleh pakai terus lah atau dia kena dak hmm, tak dia log in log in ke tak tu je nak tahu ah uh, uh. uh, kena log in kan ah uh, uh, saya tutup dulu YouTube ni eh ah uh, tutup lah tutup hmm. dah tak ada orang kan